But you should know that there are people who advocate for this uh, perspective. And they treat all of these subgroups as daughter languages of, of a mother Afroasiatic. However, with regard to Afroasiatic, there seems to be a growing consensus that this family is related to Nostratic as a sister language rather than as a daughter, as Greenberg and Harold Fleming had already proposed. So there are other people who do accept the Nostratic hypothesis, but they don't see Afroasiatic as a daughter of Nostratic. They see it as a sister, which means that there would be a mother or a father of both Afroasiatic and the Nostratic groupings. That you could probably make work, and you would make it work uh, uh, by going way back in time, and you would basically say that when you had the Out of Africa movement, that uh, the people who left a people, at least the northern part of the world, left from a region, uh, say in Northeast Africa, and that the people who were left uh, are the people who, who wound up speaking uh, Afro-Asiatic. And, and that'll work, you know. But in general, those long distance lingu ling linguistic hypotheses with the deep time reconstructions uh, don't conform to what uh, most historical linguists think is scientifically provable or valid. And so there are only a handful of people who are engaged in that. Now, in terms of geography, again, we want to have a setting for our culture. And this map illustrates that between 8,000 and 9,000 years ago, the rains had returned to Africa, so to speak, uh, and the lake levels were all high. We had Lake Mega Chad. There were, river, uh, there were rivers running the Sahara this way. Uh, and it is at this moment in time that we see people moving back into the Sahara. In fact, there are not a lot of sites in the Nile Valley at this time. And the people uh, who are in the Sahara, when conditions get worse, eventually move into the valley. So when we look at the pre-dynastic cultures of early Egypt, we see influences from the Sahara. We have Levantine influences, as I mentioned, you know, sheep, goat, cattle, the animals that were domesticated. They actually wind up in the Sahara before they are in the Nile Valley. Uh, uh, we find evidence in some cases of, of uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, goats and, and uh, goat remains. Uh, we think they're goat remains. Uh, in terms of the early pre-dynastic, there's a culture called the Tazian, which people have generally put together with the Bedarian. But the Tazian has a particular kind of beaker, uh, uh, tulip shape, that has this ancestry, uh, clearly seems to have originated in the Sudan, up and down the Nile Valley from the Neolithic, but probably ultimately of Saharan origin, and not found in the Near East, are these slate palettes. And uh, I don't have any uh, slides of those that, that I'm going to show today, but uh, just go down to the Petrie Museum in London, and you can see some beautiful ones from the Bedarian and the Nakata periods. So here we have this slide made from an article published in 2006 in Science that's entitled, uh, and I recommend that you read it, uh, uh, Holis it's, it's about the climate-driven occupation of the Western Sahara. And uh, the authors uh, uh, basically say that uh, this was a major factor in early African history. These are sites for which we have uh, good archaeological material indicating uh, some sort of settlements. And then when we go a thousand years later, we have very few sites here, but we have all of these sites along the Nile Valley. And the tool kits and the pottery in the Nile Valley represent a coherent mixing of the hunting gathering traditions in the Nile Valley with the traditions from the Sahara. And as I said, uh, with some things, uh, influences from the Sudan in early Egypt. Uh, this is more artistic. I normally don't do art, but just to show you, this is from uh, Oto Ori, who's a, a Basque uh, Egyptologist. Uh, and in this, he, in this particular article, what he's trying to show is that we can sort of, quote, read Saharan paintings, and we can see similar motifs in early Egyptian art. So you have in early Saharan paintings, you have men with Elephants, you don't normally think of elephants being in the Eastern Sahara, but they were there at one time. Uh, this motif, men, did he really actually, it's hard to believe the giraffes would let you do this 
to them. But anyway, it's there. And we see these motifs in Egyptian art. Now, some people have argued that this sort of motif, taming of the two beasts, is actually of, of Near Eastern origin. Well, OK, let's take the compromise position and say that you may have, have had traditions of the taming of the wild beast from multiple sources. But nevertheless, you do see it in the Sahara. And in the Sahara, it's older than it is in Egypt or Mesopotamia. This deformation of cattle horns, still seen in southern Sudan today, was also practiced in the Sahara. And in this rather late depiction of a cow in ancient Egypt, we see this same practice going on. Uh, here are some more things. Again, certain similarities from the Saharan art seen also in Egyptian art. So again, this is just to talk about an archaeological connection of regions in Africa, in the surrounding areas, being connected to the Nile Valley. We've already talked about language as well. Now, physical anthropology is what everybody, everybody thinks that biology tells you everything. I'm here to tell you it doesn't. But since we, many of us believe it does, we're going to talk about it. The problem with previous work in general is that uh, they were based on what, on what I call race models. And all the traditional racial studies are deductive. That is to say, they assume that you have some, quote, racial types, well-defined anatomical complexes, sets of physical traits, such that whenever you see uh, an individual who doesn't fit either one, your explanation is that they must be a mixture of the two extremes, OK? Now, of course, we see people in real life who, are, who have one parent from one place and one parent from another place. So it's quite possible that, you know, so we, we have actually seen people who are that way. But the question is, is that the explanation in all places and for all times? Well, if you believe that, then you leave Darwin out of the picture. You believe a notion of, of evolution and, uh, and other kinds of processes out. Uh, so one type of study works from a presumption of, of, of groups that mix. The other kind of study takes a little bit different point of view, and it's usually involved, involves mathematics, whereby you, you measure up something, you submit it to the computer, and see where things cluster or where they group. That always is not foolproof either, because you need a model. You need a model. So you ground your discussion, from my point of view, and talking about African diversity, OK? And these are the different uh, sub areas of, of human biology that have been useful. Skeletal biology, serogenetics, DNA, uh, that all f feed into us being able to talk about population diversity and origins. As I've said earlier, I believe that you have to use archaeology, linguistics, and history. You have to talk about populations versus what are called typological studies. You have to be willing to talk about your methodology and whether or not just because you measure it and, which, and you get results from the computer uh, that this is, this is easily interpretable without a model. You have to talk about the history, the sociology of knowledge. That is to say, uh, are the facts determined by people in power? You have to talk about history of ideas. And we want to talk about phenotype versus descent. Now, The easiest way to, to talk about this is to understand that in this little diagram here, think of this as an ancestral tree. And you've got A and B and C as the descendants from some ancestors here. And this similarity is a similarity. It refers to how closely they resemble each other. And this word descent here actually refers to where they're connected. A, B, and C are equally similar. But B and C are more recently connected in terms of ancestry.